Hi everyone, my name is Thelma Carrera. I work with the Office of Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman. I'm a constituent services representative. And today we're here with some guests. Um, we will be discussing how the pandemic has shifted the community, um, the undocumented immigrant community and uh, that community's needs and how Congress has stepped in what is still needed and what is currently being done on the ground. So joining us, we have Deya Dana from Make the Road, New Jersey. And we also have Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman. Congresswoman, if you want to open with any remarks. Oh, okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank Deya for joining us today. I look forward to a very robust conversation with you. And Thelma, I want to thank you for coordinating this and you know making sure that we are dealing with uh, having a discussion and dealing with issues that hopefully we can address as a result of the upcoming election or after the upcoming election, and that uh, we can inform people right now of their rights and uh, their expectations and what we're trying to do in Congress to keep everybody safe and to keep government functioning on behalf of all the people. And I just think this is an important discussion now. So thank you very much for uh, leading us in it. Back to you. Thea, do you have any, any opening remarks? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, good afternoon, Congresswoman. We're so happy to be here with you today. My, like I mentioned, my name is Deya Aldana and I am an organizer with Make the Road New Jersey. Make the Road New Jersey builds the power of immigrant and working class communities to achieve dignity and respect. We do that through community organizing, legal services, policy innovation, and transformative education. Again, thank you so much for being a champion of immigrant rights in Washington, D.C. You know, in my organizing, I have I have the privilege of working with immigrant communities who are fighting every day to build a state and country that is strong and welcoming for everyone. So we're just really excited to be here um, today. Thank you, Daya. Great. So let's dive right into it. Um, so this first question is for Daya. Um, so how has organizing looked like during this pandemic? Since everything has had to switch from in-person to virtual, how has organizing looked for you and Make the Road? And what have you seen um, in the shifts uh, in the undocumented immigrant community and the, the needs and policy-wise? Yeah, so I mean, no news to anyone here, right? But this is the fight for our lives. We're, we're fighting for our lives every single day. Um, the pandemic has hit every corner of our state and Black and Latinx immigrants as frontline workers, often without access to healthcare, have been adversely and disproportionately impacted by the virus. Despite being essential workers, despite disproportionately suffering, it's immigrants and our families that the Trump administration has targeted to be completely excluded from aid. Um, you know, imagine trying to survive the pandemic without a paycheck, no unemployment, no pandemic unemployment insurance, no food stamps, no temporary assistance, no stimulus check. Immigrant families have been systematically carved out of almost every type of aid by Republicans in Congress. And now it's been seven months since the pandemic hit and our communities are suffering. We're fighting back, right? Uh, it's the fight of our lives, our dignity, our families, our health and our country. Um, you know, we build movement and leaders through organizing. So every night of the week, now we're on Zoom. We used to be in person. Um, and, you know, we miss our members very much, um, being able to hug them and just being able to be in community. But every night of the week on Zoom, dozens of immigrant community members come together to learn their rights, strategize about campaigns that they want to take on and make changes in their communities and take action. So we're doing everything virtually now, you know, everything that we used to do in person and in our offices, we've moved on to a virtual reality, a virtual world. Um, really fortunate that we were able to train our, our adult members on how to use things like Zoom and how to get on technology because that was really important to be able to maintain a relationship with them. And before we, we move on, I, I just want to share the results of a survey that we did. Um, so we, you know, we're in communication with our communities every single day, and we did a survey. Um, you know, six, it's called six months later because we did one at the beginning of the pandemic to just see where where our communities are. Right, 
And in this survey, we found that 81% of people who responded live in a household where a member of the household lost their job during the pandemic. 83% of respondents were worried about being able to pay the light bills. 85% of respondents were worried about being able to pay for food for themselves or their family. 77.3% of responses were worried about being able to buy medicine for themselves or for their families. And one in four owed four months in back rent. Um, and you know, with the looming uh, potential of the eviction crisis, we saw that 81% were concerned that they would not be able to pay next month's rent. Um, you know, I myself am undocumented, fortunate enough to have DACA, um, but I lived a lot of these things, right, with my family. My parents were left out of the stimulus check. My mother and my sister and my father, unfortunately, all became ill with COVID at the beginning of the pandemic, doing much better now, thankfully, right? Um, but my mom did lose her job. Um, and when she went after, you know, recovering to try and get her hours back, they simply told her that there wasn't employment for her at that time and that she should sit at home and wait around for them to call her back. Some of our members were forced to move during this pandemic because their lease was up and because of hostile situations with their landlords. So we've seen an array of everything that's happening, right? But again, I'm really fortunate to be here in this conversation. And also I consider myself incredibly privileged to be able to lead this work and to actually be able to talk to our community every day and for them to see us as a resource. So um, yeah, we're just looking forward to seeing what more resources we can come up with together and how we can continue to push for um, stimulus and economic relief for those families. Thank you so much, Daya, for sharing that. Um, those statistics that you shared um, are very jarring um, and are very alarming to all of us. Um, and in, in sharing that, um, can you also share some goals that Make the Road has as, as of now for our undocumented families in New Jersey to receive the resources they yes, need? Yes, for sure. So um, at the state level, we are pushing for what we're calling um, Alivio Para Todo or economic relief for everyone, right? And in this um, this package or what, what we want to gain for our communities is we want um, unemployment insurance, right? We saw that a lot of people who qualified for unemployment insurance were getting $600 a month. We want the same thing for people who've been paying into the system for years, right? Our undocumented workers, um, those who lost their job, right, or those who are frontline workers now are still paying to this unemployment system that they haven't received a penny of, right? Um, we, we, we saw that um, there was about $1.1 billion that goes into the federal, um, the federal government, right, in form of taxes paid by immigrants from the state of New Jersey, and close to $600 million that go into state and local taxes paid by undocumented people, right? So we're asking for um, an insurance, um, we're, talk, we're, we're asking for um, $600 a week, and we're also asking for the equivalent of a stimulus payment um, because a lot of our families were left out, you know, including my family where my father is a resident and is a social, has a social and a taxpayer, right? And because my mom is an ITIN holder, she, they were left out without any, any money coming into their household. So we're asking, we're essentially asking to have the same things that our citizens, brothers and sisters and family received during this pandemic. Although we know that was not enough for them, right? Um, we're trying to just meet people where they already are. Thank you so much for sharing that, Daya. Um, Congresswoman, this next question is for you. Um, so what actions has Congress taken up to this point to support undocumented families during the pandemic? Um, as Daya has shared, a lot of families have been excluded. Um, so we just want to hear a little bit about what has been, uh, been uh, done in Congress and what everyone is fighting for at this moment. Thanks, Thelma. Uh, Daya, thank you for sharing the information uh, with me that you just shared and thank you for your organization's work. It's so vitally important right now and organizing is just so important um, and making sure that you are being able to communicate with uh, those whose interests you serve and to those who should be representing your interests. So I'm going to tell you that Congress has done a lot if you want to talk about the House of Representatives. And we've recognized right from the from the giddy up 
that undocumented uh, individuals should have been included in the coronavirus uh, relief packages. And right now we are still negotiating, except for maybe not for the next couple of days now, um, uh, the HEROES package, which was the latest iteration of coronavirus uh, uh, protection act that had something in it that I was very much supportive of and, and I think instrumental in getting it to be a part of the package, and that was the um, uh, essential workers' additional pay. And yes, indeed, I agree that you all are entitled to uh, the unemployment insurance um, increase to six hundred dollars, and you're entitled to the stimulus checks. I don't think any of that was adequate for anybody, but I do think that the, that no one who needed it and who met the criteria from an economic perspective should have been left out. You know, it, I tell you, it was breaking my heart listening to the scenarios that you were sharing with us because in this country, this country that had indigenous people in it, when people from Europe decided that they wanted to come move here and make it their own com country, they're immigrants. And how this country could treat immigrants with any uh, less respect and uh, acknowledgement that it was through uh, the diversity of our nation that made this nation great hurts me to my heart and angers me. And every effort we've tried to advance from the House of Representatives has been either diminished or disregarded uh, by the Senate. And that's why it's so important that we do what we need to do in the upcoming weeks so that we have a, a leadership at the very top and leadership in the Senate and leadership in the House of Representatives that recognizes that we have a collective responsibility and that until we deal with those who are the least um, among us right now, whether or not it's economic issues or healthcare issues or educational issues or housing issues, unless we're willing to lift up from there, then we're never, ever, ever going to experience the kind of, of freedom and, and um, vitality that was was thought of even when our founding fathers weren't thinking about us, even though what they were thinking about themselves, you know? So we've done everything we can in, in terms of advancing standalone bills that address um, your status in terms of being eligible for the stimulus check for the access to health care, for the, for the um, treatment, um, for, for the testing and the contact tracing, and for whatever else, uh, even small businesses um, that, that the undocumented uh, community owns. I mean, we go there, we frequent those. We don't even know necessarily if you're a citizen or you're undocumented. We don't care. We just care whether or not the product that you're offering or the food that you're offering is, you know, is something that we want. Uh, we're all in this together. And the, the House of Representatives recognizes this. And so we not only try to do the standalone bills, we try to put the language in the appropriations bills to to make sure that all of our communities, and we know black and brown has suffered tremendously under this uh, COVID. We were suffering before. We were marginalized before, and it has gotten worse. And that's why it's so essential that we get a handle on this and redirect this country in direction that recognizes our collective responsibility. Thank you so much for that, Congresswoman. Dea, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, I just want to share how much, like, how much we echo those words, right? Um, and uh, you know, something that comes to mind as we're having this conversation. Um, I remember very early on speaking to our members, and one of the conversations that I had, which absolutely broke my heart, was, um, you know, one of our members was like, "So it's I'm I'm valuable when I have to pay taxes, and I'm valuable to this country when they get to take out all the taxes from my paycheck." but i don't i don't i'm not worth anything when it comes to them trying to protect my life and help me right um and she is a, a laundry worker um who works at a facility that cleans um the the sheets and all the laundry that comes from the local hospitals right um and i remember um how difficult it was to hear our members say um say that right and questioning their own worth so um really like 
our members are going to be incredibly excited to hear that there's people in Congress who understand how much they are worth and how much we value them in this country. Um, and like we've been saying, right, um, if immigrants don't thrive, then New Jersey doesn't thrive. And if New Jersey doesn't thrive, then that means the country will, will not thrive. Um, so we need to make sure that everyone gets out of this, not just some of us, right? Um, so they, again, thank you. And we know we, we've been uh, trying to push the HEROES Act in the Senate as well, but we also understand um, how rigid the conditions are there. Well, let me just tell you that um, you got a partner in me to, to do whatever we need to do. I mean, we need to not only deal with uh, the, the impact of this coronavirus. This is a crisis that we're in right now. And we, we need to ensure that we're doing the right thing for everybody as it relates to getting through this crisis. But even beyond that, we've got so much work to do. We have a uh, tremendous um, reform of our Im immigration rules and practices and policies. We need to make sure that we have clear pathways to citizenship. And we need to recognize that, that everyone deserves dignity and respect. And so I'm so glad that we've got uh, your organization in New Jersey and organizations across the country that we get to communicate with and to hear from because your stories are compelling and your stories are important to us and your stories are, are different, but we share similarities in being minority communities. Uh, we've got to look at what it takes for us to turn this country around. And there is no better time than now. I feel like I'm, I'm in the most consequential time I've ever been in public service in my entire life. My entire professional career has been in public service and my entire career has been around issues involving those whose voices have been marginalized. And so you have a lot of people. There are a lot of people in the House of Representatives and there really are a lot of people in the Senate. Um, who share these same concerns and share this responsibility we know that we have to make sure that you have your pathway to citizenship, that you have your protection if you're not a citizen, that you have the right to thrive and to work and to, to have decent housing and to have access to health care. All of those things are important. We just got to get rid of those who don't believe in those things, you know? or just make sure that they're in such a minority that they can sit in the corner and suck their thumbs for whatever we care, but that they can't uh, continue to, to devastate uh, who we are, the fundamental belief in who we should be and how we're all in this together. So I thank you for sharing your, uh, your the experiences that you're having with your Make the Road um, virtuality right now. Um, it, it really is giving us a chance to to connect in ways we hadn't been able to before. And then you're empowering your members to be able to talk to the people in there within their communities, in their neighborhoods, and let them know who's working for what and, and what we should be working for together. It's so vitally important. Thank you and God bless the work that you do. Thank you. So to segue from that, um, the question is to both of you. So how can, um, people who do the on the ground work, such as Make the Road New Jersey and elected officials, how can we bring um, both of these entities together to create change? Yeah, so I can get us started if that's okay. Um, again, and I know I'm gonna say this a, a bunch of times during this conversation, but we really do wanna take the time to thank you um, for your leadership, right? Um, for not only supporting the, the HEROES Act, but being a true champion in Washington, D.C. And because our communities know that they can count on you to do the right thing on behalf of their families, right? Um, and it's it's not very often that folks are able to say that. So we find ourselves in a really good place um, knowing that, um, you know, we have some some a lot of good people from New Jersey in, in the Senate and in the House, right? Um, so we do want to say thank you for the leadership. Um, you know, I think I think that our stories need to make it to Washington, D.C. I think that it's very it's it's become very easy to take away the the human aspect of these stories, right? Um, especially when you hear statistics or you feel like you've heard it all before, and um, 
you know, it's, it's seven months in, right? At the beginning, these were the, the, the impactful stories. These were the hard hitting stories. But after a while, people stop covering these stories. People stop talking about these issues, right? Um, but it doesn't mean that our families are no longer living it. So we really true ask that our stories make it to Washington DC, right? That they, they're they heard in the halls of Congress, um, in the tunnels, in the gallery, everywhere, that people do not forget that our people and the people in New Jersey are still having a really difficult time in this moment. Um, you know, we, we have a laundry list of ask um, that, that we have from Congress um, and we're hopeful that when we have this new administration um, that we'll be able to get all of these things in motion and these gears in motion. So I think that, uh, first of all, let me just uh, give a shout out to the governor of the state of New Jersey, who I think um, thinks like we do and feels like we do and recognizes our collective responsibility for one another. I always talk about things like, am I my sister or my brother's keeper? Yeah, I am. And if, if, if you know, I'm given a platform to do something, then I better use it for the good that it was intended. And so I want to thank the governor for things that he's done, like trying to stave off evictions and trying to make sure that there's access to health care, uh, trying to ensure that no one's electricity and heat and things of that nature are cut off and then trying to uh, do whatever he can with the limited dollars that New Jersey still has to be able to make it better for everybody. But he's depending upon the federal government as well, because a good chunk of that HEROES Act was to put money back into states and counties and municipalities who have been um, uh, keeping our first responders, our essential workers, uh, our teachers, our nurses, our doctors, our police, our firemen, you know, things of that nature, um, they need resources as well. So you're absolutely right about getting your message to Washington. And you can get your message to Washington. You can share your message with our New Jersey delegation. And we'll carry that message from the New Jersey perspective. And I'm sure that when we talk to some of our, our colleagues, we'll recognize that what we're bringing from New Jersey is the same discussion, the same narrative, the same uh, list of needs and expectations that are coming from the undocumented community across this country. And so we'll we'll co coalesce behind that. You know, we've got some important caucuses within Congress, the Progressive Caucus the Congressional Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, the Asian Pacific Caucus, the LGBTQ Caucus. Those caucuses are about identity and issues of and, and concern. And they're about values. And that we will share those information that, that's coming in among all of us and make sure that that gets translated into policy that we get to vote on. And in addition, you all, I expect very much for uh, Joe Biden to hear from you all. It's important that the Biden um, uh, presidency hears firsthand. I mean, I've already seen all indications that Joe Biden recognizes this path to citizenship and recognizes how important it is for us to deal with the immigration issues and the immigrant community, unlike what we've seen from um, the, the current person in, in the sitting in that seat. Um, these are important. These, this is, this is very important. And when we get the chance to take on these issues from a different perspective, no one needs to get comfortable that it's happening. Everyone needs to stay engaged and, and make sure that we are hearing from people regularly. Here's the issue. You're not moving fast enough. Come on, get it going. Okay, we're moving in the right direction. That's good. Now get on to the next thing. Because I believe that we're best when we elect the people that represent our values, but then we hold them accountable to work the system. Yeah, that that's so true. Um, you know, I think um I think the, the one of the only positives, right, we've seen in the last four years is that we've gotten more people engaged more people excited about this process. And we, we, you know, we do transformative education where we are, we're, we're pushing people to be their own leaders. So we're mm -hmm. really hopeful that um, we, we have a, a really good group of leaders ready for accountability and whatever the next path forward looks like. 
You know, I, t I spent some time on a Zoom call this morning with a basketball team uh, from a, a local college. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, we need to do more of this with the very young people because they need to know how important they are in uh, participating in this democracy and making sure that those things that they need, whether it's, you know, student debt or job opportunities. And we need things like a big infrastructure program that puts everybody to work. We need guaranteed income programs. You know, we need to make sure that no family in this country falls beneath a certain floor. And, in to, and to do that, we need to do things that people might think are, think are like really wild that I think are quite normal like baby bonds and guaranteed income and extending the EITC. You know, you never have to jump through hoops when you're trying to give millionaires and billionaires better tax tax uh, breaks. So I don't want to have to jump through hoops to make those who are the neediest among us eligible uh, for resources and support so that they too can participate and, and thrive in our society. And that's the kind of Congress and that's the kind of, of federal government that I'm looking forward to. Thank you so much. Um, so Daya, um, what in your work have you seen that the undocumented community needs exactly from their elected officials? Um, and how yeah, can we so get um, as we know, the HEROES Act was incredibly important and it's still incredibly important to get to the actual hands of the community that needs it, right? Um, and we're thankful that the HEROES Act passed the House because we know that that would provide economic relief um, as well as testing opportunities for our communities, right? Um, and if we're being frank, what the community needs is immediate relief. We are not going to to thrive as a country and thrive as communities if we do not help everyone. We also need unemployment insurance. We, we have now been in this for seven months. When the, when the state of emergency happened in New Jersey, and I like people who qualified for unemployment, many immigrant families have not seen a check since the beginning of this pandemic, right? And they're relying on things like our organization, as well as food pantries, as well as the kindness of, of hearts from community members, right? Um, but it, but I do wanna touch on something that's really important. We had issues before COVID, right? If anything, COVID just made them more apparent. You know, COVID has shown us things that we've known for such a long time. And one of them being is that the tension must end. The tension centers the detention and the deportation of our people must end. Being in a detention center during COVID is a death sentence for a lot of our people. And we wanna thank you, um, you know, again, for your work supporting the family of Mar Marie Juarez. Um, she was from your district and unfortunately she died when she was detained when she was two years old. And this was before COVID, right? And it has to stop. If, if COVID showed us anything is that detention centers where you cannot socially distance, where there is not enough hygiene products, our breeding grounds for COVID-19. And we're in, a, we're in a moment and you know, we're hopeful with a new administration that will be able to eradicate these things and be able to have immigrant communities thrive. So one of the things that we're calling on and we will always, you know, is the abolishment of ICE and the ending of detention. Time and time again, we have seen that ICE and CVP are rogue agencies and every year, we have the same question, right? Whether we're going to continue to fund these agencies that continue to hunt down our communities. And for us, the answer is always no. The ask is always to drastically decrease the fundings of ICE and CVP to completely abolish the agencies that are hunting down our communities and terrorizing our families. So we ask for the abolishment of ICE, for, um, and you know, we know that we know that that's big picture, right? And we know that there's things that we need to do along the way to make sure that we actually get there. And the most immediate thing is ensuring that we don't continue to fund these agencies, right? We don't give them more taxpayer money. We're in a situation where, you know, the state of New Jersey is counting on federal money to make sure we get out of COVID. We're not in a situation where there's money to spare anywhere, especially not to give to agencies that are going to continue to terrorize, you know, and I, 
And I think about people like my mama, right? She's undocumented. I have DACA, my siblings have DACA, and we're, we're in this protected bubble for now, right? But my mom is not. And there's always that worry that something could happen. There's always that worry that we are like, and for, for me, right, I'm always like, well, we live 30 minutes away from the Elizabeth Detention Center. That means this, right? Or like there was raids in New York. That means we could be next, right? And knowing that I have to call my family and be like, be careful, you know? So we want to make sure that we're, we're taking the right steps to the, towards the abolishment of ICE. Um, you know, one of the other things, and we're really fortunate in New Jersey, we have universal representation, which means that some people actually get access to legal counsel while they're in immigration detention, but also because we are connected in this fight, right? And it's not just about New Jersey, but it's about everyone. We want to make sure that this is something that everyone in the nation has access to, that they're able to seek legal counsel while they are detained. You know, we've heard stories of people who are like three or seven years old having to defend themselves in immigration court, right? We want to make sure that the people are ready so that they're able to present their facts to an immigration judge for there to be a better chance of them proving their case and being able to reunify or to escape the violence that we see a lot of people doing in this moment, right? So we're asking for, for that to be something that is, that is nationwide. And like I mentioned, I myself am a DACA recipient. I've spent the majority of this administration fighting for my life, right? Um, my, my DACA is not only protection from deportation, um, but my DACA is what allows me to have health insurance and as someone who is also type one diabetic, um, who wears an insulin pump that without insurance would cost over $10,000, right? Um, means that my actual life and my survival is dependent on my DACA, right? Um, and it's not only me, right? We saw the Muslim band, we saw the, the ending of TPS and the targeting of specific communities, targeting of communities that look like me, right? That look like my family, people who are brown, people who are black, right? Um, being targeted in this administration. And we're hoping that with the new administration, we'll be able to undo all of the negative policies that were implemented by this one. And that we're able to, you know, first step, clear it out, new slate, and move towards citizenship for everyone, right? We, we no longer want citizenship for some. We no longer want um, DACA protections for some, right? We want citizenship and a pathway to citizenship for everyone in this country, um, for, every immigrant family to no longer have to worry about being detained or being deported, right? A lot of the people who are still working during COVID and are undocumented are essentially frontline workers. And they shouldn't have to worry about leaving their homes every day on top of potentially risking their lives to COVID, but now also potentially being detained or being deported and being separated indefinitely from their families, right? We have seen people who, who are, de who are in, the, in this specific moment, like on a deportation pipeline, who have either been transferred out of state, who are currently sitting in the Elizabeth Detention Center, right away from their families and their loved ones. So, I mean, you know, top line, right, is we want to abolish ICE and we will always want to push for that abolishment of ICE. We need citizenship for everyone. And while, while we're in the process of abolishment and citizenship for everyone, there's steps that we can take, right? Like making sure folks in detention have access to counsel, like making sure we undo the racist anti-immigrant policies that came out of this administration when we have a new one. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but I'm incredibly confident. Um, and you know, we, we, we've seen as of yesterday that 2.8 million people in New Jersey have already casted their ballot. That is nearly 78% of the people who went out to vote in 2016. So we're really confident and I'm really holding on to hope that young people are making it out to the polls, right? Um, and that people are like, you know, and anybody who was undecided, I hope they've decided at this point. Uh, but if they watch this, right, I hope that this pushes them in the right direction to do the right thing on behalf of families like mine. So we're really holding on to Tuesday. Um, but after Tuesday, you know, after we, after, well, whenever we find out, we have to get going and we have to continue working. Well, you're an amazing advocate. Um, you know, um, I know Thelma's going to direct a question to me, but uh, n another policy that we need to, first of all, we need to look at alternatives to detention because people are being detained who have no reason to be there. They're not violent. They're waiting for something else to happen. We need to find, the, and they will show up when they need to show up before court. And so this whole issue of um, 
detention is just an extension of the over mass, the over over incarceration of, of brown and black people, even citizens in this country, and we need to stop right. it. And we need to make sure that no child is separated from his or her parent. That is an abomination that they have done that, and that no one, no one is sitting for 30 seconds or 30 days in what looks like a big freaking dog cage. And so, and no border should be closed to those who are seeking asylum because they are fleeing from fear from their own communities. There's so much wrong with our immigration policy right now. And ICE, I'm not, I don't know about ICE being completely uh, eliminated or if ICE needs to be re redirected back to its original intention and not allowed to just sort of go do the mean and evil things that it was given permission to do under this administration. But I agree with you 1000% that ICE as it stands right now needs to be stopped. And as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, my chairman, Benny Thompson, and uh, my colleagues were working very hard to make sure that the whole department and the Board of Patrol and everybody else is more accountable in what's going on. But from the very top, we need different leadership so that our policies are different, our, expe our expectations are different, and our accountability is different. Thank you so much to the both of you. Um, so this last question is, what do we hope to see in the next year um, in terms of our federal government, uh, whether it's in the US House of Representatives or in the Senate or all the way at the top? What do we hope uh, happens in this next year um, and how can we make that happen? So we can make it happen by everybody going out and voting. But from my perspective, I am looking for the ability to tackle the important issues from the immigration reform that we've talked about here, the climate change issues that we talked about and how they affect our communities, even our poor indigenous communities. I'm looking for social justice. I'm looking for criminal justice reform. I'm looking for job opportunities. I'm looking for the elimination of poverty. I'm looking for the guarantee of jobs and a guarantee of a basic and fundamental income. And I'm looking for the first 100 days to, to crush this virus and to make sure that the resources that are in the HEROES Act, not only are they, um, is the HEROES Act passed and implemented, but that we recognize that because we waited so doggone long to do this last iteration, that even more is needed. And so for me, I'm expecting a change for the righteousness. And I want to be a part of that. And I want to make sure that we are connecting constantly with those advocacy organizations like Make the Road, like DEA, and so that we know that we're on the right track as we're pursuing things. So I wanna do this. I'm wearing John Lewis's shirt. I wanna make sure that we're doing good trouble. That's right. I think, um, I think our folks are ready. Um, they're ready for good trouble, right? Um, I'm really hopeful um, that the next generation of voters will really get us to where we need to be this um, this year. You know, I, I'm fortunate that my partner had the ability to vote. Um, and I always get really emotional when I see all my friends posting the I voted stickers, right? Because um, I know they know my story and I know that they carry my story to the polls, right? Um, and although no one in my immediate family has the ability to vote, um, it means that there's people who, who who know me, who know my mom, right? Um, and whenever anyone does anything and they're like, well, we're doing this for your community, right? I'm like, you're doing this for my mom, right? And whether you know her or you don't know her, just know that like, that is the most valuable thing that you could ever do for me is to keep my story and my mom in your heart. I um, mean, she's 4'11 and she's super sweet. And, um, you know, she'll give you the shirt off her back if she could. Um, and to know that she, she's in people's minds and in people's hearts, 
I think that that's, that's phenomenal. And in terms of the first hundred years, at the first hundred years, the first hundred days, right? Um, is keep my mom in your hearts, right? Um, my mom has been in the country for over 22 years. Um, you know, my mom has had two of her, her sisters pass away and her mom pass away without being able to say goodbye, right? Um, and I'm hopeful that in the first hundred days, we'll see a pathway towards citizenship for everyone that includes my mom and that doesn't throw anyone under the bus, right? And when I say a pathway to citizenship for everyone, I mean everyone. Latinx stories are not the only immigrant stories, right? Um, we have black immigrants, we have Asian immigrants, immigrants from all over the country, all over the world, right? Um, with many different stories. And I want this to include everyone. So we're gonna push really hard in the first hundred days. Um, and we're gonna push really hard for the next four years and as long as it takes to get to where we need to go. Um, for the day that I get to walk into my mom's kitchen and tell her that we finally won. Wow. Well, thank you so much to the two of you for sharing and coming together today and strategizing about what we're supposed to be doing now and in, in the first hundred days and in the future to come. Uh, Dama, so thank you for facilitating this conversation. This was really important. It was good to hear from Dea. Dea, you're amazing. I hope we get to work together over the next four years. So God bless you. God bless your mama. And I hope that we do what we need to do to make sure that your dreams, which are logical, rational, reasonable dreams are fulfilled. Thank you so much. This is um, truly a breath of fresh air to be in such a positive space. Um, I'm going to hold on to this for the next couple of days um, until after the elections, because um, truly means that there is great people where they need to be. So thank you so much for hosting this and for, you know, just talking to our community. Um, and sharing the space.